Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and support our new movement by putting Let's Go Viral in the comment section. But if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to give us a five-star rating and a nice review. But without further ado, here are your hosts, Nicely Chunk of Benny and Greg King. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast, members of the Off The Ball Network. And today we're going to be discussing which teams are going to be the biggest threat to the Golden State Warriors come this postseason. And just judging by what the Western Conference looks like right now, there's a few teams that have been depleted by injuries, such as the Denver Nuggets and the Los Angeles Clippers. And then we've also had a few playoff teams take a step back, such as the Los Angeles Lakers. Dallas Mavericks to a certain degree, and definitely the Portland Trailblazers. So with all that being said, there's not too many teams that really are going to be in contention for a conference title this year, but we were able to nibble it down to two teams, and I want to have Sam Goldfarb from Davidson, uh, another guest appearance on the Ball Fake Podcast today, start out with his thoughts about Phoenix. Yeah, I mean, I think the Phoenix Suns, especially defensively, are cut out the best to match up with Golden State. I mean, you look at it, it's a turnover-based defense that gets in your grill. They're great off-ball, and that's how you defend Golden State, which obviously will bring all these off-ball motions, all this side-to-side stuff, all this unpredictability. You need a team that's going to keep up with that. Meanwhile, when you flip to offensively, I think Phoenix is versatile enough and scores in enough ways to give Golden State problems. You obviously have Chris Paul and Devin Booker out of isolation and ball screen situations and then when the defense over commits you can hit eight and on a dive to the rim or some sort of skip pass to a guy like Cam Johnson or Macau Bridges who can give you problems from three and cutting to the rim so I just think Phoenix on paper and also in practice from what we've seen them matching up with Golden State they're versatile enough offensively and defensively they're cut out better to bother Golden State's actions. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And they're well coached. I love Monty Williams. I think he's a great X and O guy. He can make adjustments. And I think that's going to be big going to the playoffs. And like you mentioned, they have Devin Booker and Chris Paul, great in isolation, great off the pick and roll. I like DeAndre Ayton. He's actually getting better in his shot creation um, ability. Still needs work there. But I think that Phoenix has enough tools, you know, to give pressure on Golden State that we've seen so far and that. Um, I think I think with Devin Booker, you know, being a better catch and shoot uh, this year, I think Chris Paul continue to do what he's doing and, and you know, with his uh, playmaking ability. And I think guys like Mikel Bridges and Cam Johnson, I think can really help him out going to the series um, against the Warriors. Yeah. And I think what's going to help Phoenix is the is their personnel. I mean, matchup wise, they probably match up best to Golden State compared to, you know, all the other teams in the NBA, including some of these guys in the Eastern Conference, maybe even the Milwaukee Bucks, you know, teams like the Brooklyn Nets. I think Phoenix matches up a little bit better just because they kind of have Phoenix is a little bit of a spitting image of the Golden State Warriors from a personality standpoint. I mean, I know, you know, both teams have different play styles. We know Golden State's a lot more three-point oriented. They have a high frequency of attempts from that standpoint. And Phoenix, you know, they're kind of total opposites from that, you know, dynamic. Really two-point oriented. There's going to be a lot more pick and roll um, offensively. And, you know, they're a little bit more dynamic from that uh, standpoint. You know, Golden State likes to use a lot of pin downs to get uh, guys like Curry in their action, Jordan Poole. And then when he, Clay Thompson gets healthy, he's going to be included as well. But I think the advantage that Phoenix is going to have over Golden State, which aren't going to be too many advantages, but their interior um, presence offensively. DeAndre Ayton should be, you know, somebody that should be dominant to a certain degree going up against uh, the undersized Kevin Looney at the center position. And then, you know, in pick and roll scenarios, Golden State defensively, they throw a lot of coverages out. I think, you know, Chris Paul is smart enough to, you know, hunt out mismatches because in t- depending on who the backline defender is um, defensively in the pick and roll, whether it's a Draymond Green, and in some cases it might be a Bielitsa, but more than likely Kelvin Looney, sometimes they will, you know, either obviously play drop coverage and other times they're going to hedge those screens. I think Chris Paul, he's smart enough to be able to hit DeAndre Ayton on the roll, man, or you have options in the throwback, kind of like... uh. In- Similar to how Utah runs their pick and roll offense with uh, Rudy Gobert. And not to mention, you know, uh, Phoenix, number four in scoring frequency when Chris Paul keeps it by himself. Number one when Aiton finishes as a roll guy in the pick and roll. From that, from all those dynamics offensively, I think Phoenix is going to be phenomenal from that standpoint. But defensively, Greg, Sam, can you guys tell me what some of those advantages might be on that end of the basketball for the Phoenix Suns? I think the biggest thing is their ability to cut out the off-ball stuff. I think 
when you're matching up against Golden State, there are two keys. It's to turn them over and to make sure you're covering and communicating on all of the flare screens, all the down screens, all the side to side actions that they're going to throw at you. And I think that Phoenix has enough great off ball defenders. You look at a guy like Macau Bridges, Cam Johnson can deputize with his length, Jay Crowder as well. And then of course, Chris Paul's got an incredible basketball IQ, although his defense isn't quite what it was maybe two, three years ago. It's still good. Right. I think that because of that, Phoenix is cut out to be able to bother jumping passing lanes, cut off actions at the at the head of the snake, so to speak. And I think that that gives Golden State problems, takes away some of the open three point looks or even prevents them from getting those looks in the first place. Yeah, you're totally right. And when you're looking at the Warriors, they're 29th in turnovers, and Phoenix is fifth in steals. So you brought up guys like Mikel Bridges. I mean, he's long, he's athletic, he can move his feet, really good lateral quickness. Uh, Chris Paul is almost averaging two steals a game. So I think they have enough guys, you know, who and they're good with team communication as well. They know their assignment, they know where they need to be, they know how to rotate. They're not late. They um they're just very you know basketball sound on that on that on that side of the basketball. And I think when you take all those things into account, they have a Jay Crowder as well, who's really good and can be pesty. On the defensive end and get you know get your uh, your second best player rowdy um, and un- under controlled on offense. So I think if you put that into account, I think they can definitely match up against the Warriors and really cause them problems in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean what I love about Phoenix is the fact that they they do everything in uh, unison, right? You know, there's a lot of continuity. Monty Williams well coached defensively from that standpoint. Um, obviously, you guys mentioned that you know Golden State is very turnover prone, 29th in the NBA in terms of turnovers. So you know with Phoenix being one of the better teams offensively and defensively. And I think, I believe last time I checked, they were top 10 in both of those uh, efficiencies. I think Phoenix will have a pretty good shot in terms of, you know, just being disciplined. I have some questions about whether or not they can, um, what defensive schemes are they going to be able to implement that's going to allow them to be able to alleviate some of the three-point shooting. But judging by, you know, previous postseason appearances, nine times out of 10, everybody's three ball drops in the postseason. So it might be a little bit more interesting. Really, this series is all about paying attention to detail. But defensively, I think whoever wins that matchup from that perspective is probably going to be the winner of, you know, this series overall, right? But the next team I want to talk about is the Utah Jazz. And now I know a lot of people aren't too optimistic about them. But Sam, Greg, I want to hear you guys' opinion on what are the what is the likelihood of Utah being a threat to Golden State in a conference uh, championship, so to speak? I think it's lower uh, than Phoenix, so to speak. But I think they could get to the conference finals and bother Golden State because I think they're actually cut out to stop an offense like Phoenix. The thing I like about Utah is, for one, they kind of mirror Golden State's style in a way. They like to shoot a lot of threes. They make a lot of threes. They can push it and run at a high tempo. They lead the league in scoring, I believe, so there's that. And also the thing I like about Phoenix is or excuse me, Utah, is I think that they've got a guy in Donovan Mitchell and a guy in Jordan Clarkson and and a lot of scores across the board who can uh, cause Golden State some issues. Mitchell especially, he's so herky-jerky, he's really tough to stop. And the thing about him is the second you think he's going to pull up from three, he'll drive you or he'll hit a cutter like Royce O'Neal going to the hole. I just think Utah's offense can be a little unpredictable when a guy like Clarkson or Mitchell has the ball in their hands. Now, I think that there's also drawbacks on the defensive end, which I'm sure we'll touch on later but defensive and off ball is my biggest concern about them yeah I think I agree with you Sam and I think that I think with Utah they can space the floor I think with Donovan Mitchell at the helm he can he can drive he can he he, he has a, such a good gravitational pull when he goes to the paint and he in that makes people, you know, collapse on them. They can kick it out to their shooters like Bondanovich. They have uh, Joe Ingles. And then Clarkson off the bench, you can cr- provide a great spark. I think their offense is good. Their first and field goal percentage, their eighth and three point percentage. So they can score and they can score and they can score in the three point. But my main concern, especially on the offensive end, is the lack of shot creativity and a secondary ball handler. Can they? And we saw that in the playoffs last year. You know, they were a lot, you know, Donovan Mitchell had his career playoff highs and he really didn't have anybody else on that perimeter to really help him out. I mean, with Mike Conley in and out of the lineup with injuries and Jordan Clarkson can be hot and cold off the bench and some sometimes can you know if he's out of his rhythm he can really just play himself out of the game so I think if they had another you know shot secondary ball you know creator on the offense that will definitely help them going forward um when playing the Warriors yeah I agree with both of you guys' points I think with Utah the main reason why they've been you know um, disrespected over and over each and every time come postseason is really just because you know this is a team that hasn't really um, keyed in on some of their issues right we haven't really seen too many adjustments from that standpoint I mean offensively we know that this is a you know small ball lineup that is very ball screen oriented um, you know they like to ro- run a lot of action through um, 
Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell through their horns twist sets. Um, that's going to implement a lot of flare screens and, you know, just a lot of, they're similar to Golden State's in terms of, of read and reaction type of offense, right? Um, essentially, you know, I think come postseason, you're going to be optimistic about Donovan Mitchell's play because it tends to, you know, increase come that time of the year. Um, he starts to play like a top eight, top seven player in the NBA, arguably from that time standpoint. And then I think offensively, if Mike Conley can stay healthy because he he's one of those guys going to tend to miss some time uh, every other postseason, it seems like, you know, more than likely Golden, not Golden State, Utah, excuse me, is going to be a team that you can be optimistic about from an offensive perspective. And, you know, they have an offensive rating of 120 when Mike Conley's out there initiating the offense, getting them into their actions, and everybody's in their proper placement. But, you know, when he's not on the floor due to uh, health and safety protocols or maybe an injury, so to speak, their offensive rating drops all the way to 106. And then you're putting a lot more uh, attention to detail on Donovan Mitchell's play and giving him a lot more response responsibility than what he's really used to so to speak and the offense it just doesn't look as um it looks very stagnant from that standpoint to a certain degree and they're not necessarily getting the proper actions and sometimes you know donovan mitchell he's gotten a little bit better with this but sometimes he will you know kind of rely on hero ball to a certain degree and then early in their game i noticed against you know that warriors matchup the other night he he it didn't seem like he was all that ultra aggressive so to speak with conley yeah. not um out there initiating the offense and that's why it's so important for conley to be healthy because you're gonna have everybody in the proper placements and they can uh you know excel at their roles properly but i think another thing that this team struggles with from an offensive standpoint is they're not that effective when their three balls not falling greg and sam essentially you know yeah. this is a team they went out and got rudy gay um hassan whiteside i think those are two capable offensive players i know hassan whiteside doesn't have the sexiest game in the world so to speak but he is capable of knocking down a 13 footer he can score around the rim to a certain degree maybe be a little bit active in pick and roll coverages and things of that nature and then with rudy gay mid post scoring he can stretch it out and shoot the three ball a little bit he's probably digressed from that standpoint haven't really looked at his statistics from that dynamic but he's also somebody that can just play within the X of your offense and not get in the way of anybody, so to speak. So essentially, from all those standpoints, I think Utah has a good shot from that uh, dynamic, so to speak. But what are some key adjustments and, you know, keys to the series if these guys can potentially match up with a Golden State Warriors come postseason, guys? I think the biggest thing is, for one, we talked about, like, both of you guys bring up a great point in secondary kind of ball handler. I think Donovan Mitchell, especially in the playoffs when he's on his own, a lot of teams key on it, key into him too much, and there aren't as many guys on that roster who can create their own shot. I mean, there's a lot of scoring versatility, but a guy like Bogdanovich, a guy like uh, Rudy Gay, a guy like Ingles, a guy like O'Neal, they're all better off the catch than they are creating their own looks, and I think that that's a big difference uh, when you look at a Golden State, which brings two, three guys who can really create their own shot. I think also defensively is the big issue for them. They're late on rotations. They struggle defending side to side motions. We were talking about it before recording. The biggest thing we touched on was the fact that they're better at uh, defending a team that's more uh, oriented on driving to the rim. They're a shot blocking defense. They're not a turnover defense. And I think the communication is a bit late when they get dragged out of position. When you're playing Golden State, you really can't afford to have any of those traits because they're not as oriented on driving to the rim as at Phoenix is or any other team you'd see in the playoffs. They're more oriented on creating their own shots and getting all of these off ball actions. And I think that that's the big adjustment Utah has to make. Yeah, your, your points are exactly right. And the two things that I would say, first, I would let me start with their defense. I mean, I think Rogue, I think Gobert, you know, pulling him out of the paint and the way the Warriors run their actions, you know, getting him to getting him out of the paint so they can have backdoor cuts and stuff like that and get easy shots and him getting him to contest um, because his lateral movement is good. I mean, but it's not really good where you want him to be on the perimeter guarding you know Steph Curry and chasing around those type of guys but and I think you know having having guys like Bondanovich and Ingles they're kind of their lateral quickness is kind of slow so having them on the perimeter that doesn't help as well so getting they need to be playing better team defense and really communicating and really be honed in if you know they're going to beat the Warriors and then the second thing is that I've you know kind of noticed can can Quinn Snyder out coach Steve Kerr. Is he going to do enough in the playoffs? You know, when the, when it's the heat of the moment, everybody's watching you. Can you make the right adjustments against Steve Kerr in that offense and and really get it done? Really take win games on the road, make the proper adjustments to win games on the road, and you could pitch you over in the series. So those are two things that I really noticed about the Jazz that I think if they can do those, you know, well well enough, they can beat the Warriors. I think with the Jazz, uh, if we're talking about just a coaching matchup, uh, I mean. 
Quinn Snyder, he can probably do the best job that he possibly can, but I still think that, you know, it, it comes down to personnel and matchup at the end of the day, Greg, with the, uh, you yeah. know, postseason, so to speak. Because essentially, I mean, defensively, uh, Utah, they just do not match up well with Golden State. We uh, Sam brought up the point earlier that, you know, Utah more than likely is one of those teams that are going to uh, allow you to drive into the lane and, and they're, they're going to be really reluctant on their rim protection from Rudy Gobert. And I think that's one of that's obviously one of their biggest issues that they haven't really been able to address. I would love to see them make a major trade probably get rid of Ingles a little because you know he hasn't he isn't great uh in terms you know his defense or you know maybe throwing somebody else uh, in that second unit in a trade package maybe bringing a guy like Jeremy Grant now I understand that you know he he isn't necessarily somebody that's going to be able to um contribute from a three-point perspective he's shooting like 33 percent on the year in his last five he's up to what 31 percent but essentially you have enough three-point shooters that it's not going to be too much of a drop-off right and then even come postseason What's his name? Jeremy Grant. He's one of those guys that's going to be able to do a little bit of everything defensively and offensively. So I got a lot of optimism about him from that perspective. But my last point about the defense on the exterior, they're asking Rudy Gobert to dish, just do too much for them. They want him to be somebody that provides rim protection, take away corners, be a point of attack defender, defend the pick and roll in isolation on switches. He's essentially got to guard all five. And that's one of the biggest problems for this team, especially when he's not on the floor, because they go from a top five defense to a bottom five defense. So they're going to have to probably get a little bit unique with their defensive scheming and all that good stuff. But essentially, I think Utah has a OK shot of maybe competing with Golden State. But essentially, I think Golden State will more than likely, you know, probably run those guys out of the gym. But you guys let us know what y'all think about this situation in the comment section. Who is the biggest threats to the Golden State Warriors come this postseason? Is it the Phoenix Suns or is it the Utah Jazz? But thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode with me, Greg and Sam on the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're new to our YouTube channel or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, Make sure to give us a five-star rating and a nice little review. But besides that, it's your boy, Nicey Chunga Benny. I'm here with my co-host, Greg King, and we out. We out.